Look at, look at, look at. I'm all excited. I got lumber. It's Saturday, March the 2nd, 2024. And I just had my lumber delivered. So I'm finished with the plywood for now. And now on to cutting up lumber. And this is going to take a while, but I guess the way they've got this stacked up there, I need to do the one by eights first. <laughs> so that's what's going on today. I got to clean up the shop a little bit and then uh, get some of that lumber in here and start, start ripping and cross cutting. Now for the one by eights, it's a little more difficult. The two by fours, I kind of wish the two by fours were on top because I can make short work of those. Uh, because the two by fours all just get cut to length. They just get cut to uh, 21 and, I'm gonna say 21 and three quarter. Uh, some of them will go 21 and five eighths because my pallets are just a eighth shorter than or narrower than customers' pallets. So, but that won't be the case. So what I need to do is I need to sit down at my computer and do some quick calculations as to how I wanna cut that one by eight because it's not just a one by eight part. I can't just cross cut them all in pieces. What I wanna do is I wanna rip the one by eight so that I get a, get a runner and I'll kind of show you here. I've got some parts here already. So I need things like this. I need a, a one inch part. This is the side shim on the, on the pallet. Uh, and I need, I need runners, which is that. The, the width of the runner is not written in stone. You see these two pieces are not exactly the same width. They're fine. The runner doesn't have to be a particular width. I like them to be three and a quarter to three and a half inches wide. Uh, and then I, of course I need these. Um, so that's what I need to do. The, the runner, and the rear shim are the same length. So they're 33 and a half inches long. And all of these cuts are gonna be finished length. So if I can get a, a runner and a rear, a rear shim for the pallet kind of out of one, then I can just cross cut that, and rip it into two or three pieces. So I'm, go I'm gonna figure that out and see which is the best way to cut it. And then have to do the sides, the, the side cleats and the center center, not cleats, shims, side shims and the center shims and the front shims. The front shims are short though. They're only eight inches, two inches or two and a half inches wide. Uh, that is not a set width because that'll get trimmed at the end. So the eight inch length is the finished dimension there. So I'm gonna do some figuring and then I'll come back and show you what I'm gonna do. I just thought I'd put that tractor there in case when I unstrap this, it falls apart. But if it's gonna fall apart, it'll probably go that way. <laughs> Mostly because I just put the tractor there. Let's see. I had a guy watch me do this and he was giving me crap. Boy, he was really tying into me and, and I couldn't explain what I was uh, trying to tell him. He's saying, that's gonna hit you in the face. And he's not wrong. However, if I cut this here, there's no way that that strap can reach me. It's it's going to go that way, um, you know. So as I was trying to tell him, is it can't hit me in the face because it can't reach me. It's going to go that way. It can't come this way. But uh, he was having no piece of that. He was just giving it to me. <laughs> well, okay. So that didn't fall apart, which is nice. I'll put a few of these on the tractor. These are 16 feet long, these things. Two by fours are gonna fall over.
Okay, I got them just outside the door. These are 16 feet long, so they're a little bit uh, harder to handle. But I've got my fence stop set here at 33 and a half. So that's as long as, that's the length of the pallet. And uh, so that's as long as the runners are. And that's as long as the rear shim is. I've worked out a, a cut list on my computer. There's a, a site that I found cutlistoptimizer.com seems to be a really good little program it's very simple and uh, it, it actually does a really good job so if you're looking for optimizing your your cut lists and helping out with larger product projects with a lot of different materials and and parts uh, check it out um, there's a free version you can do like five calculations a day or something if you want to do more than that you give the guy 15 bucks and you can use it for the month <clears throat> so I usually I'll usually subscribe for March and April or something in there it's really nice to help somebody who's going to create a piece of software like that for you uh, so I'm going to consult that and before I cut any of this lumber up and we'll see how we can cut it in the best way according to the application Cut list optimizer. I can cut 20 of these uh, just at 33 and a half, and then I can rip them in two and make runners. So that's exactly what I'm about to do here. I've measured my fence already and my stop at 33 and a half, right there. And so now I just bring bring the long pieces in. And do that a bunch of times. And these are nice that I can cut these two at a time, I think. You see me turn some of these around. Uh, this is a great big nasty knot here. There's going to be an off cut even after I cut the cleats. So I'm going to turn this around and I can maybe get rid of that. Some of those others had cracks in the end. make sure I do is get them against the stop and the fence. All right, so safety glasses. I was saying to my wife today that I've worn glasses and contacts for most of my life and I'm very much more aware now uh, of my naked eyes now that I've had my eye surgeries. Uh, so I'm far more likely to uh, wear safety glasses when I do anything. Cut list says that the off cut will make uh, end cleats for the lids. I'll save those. Okay, and now I'll go back to the cut list and uh, 
pick out the next one that has the most number of pieces to cut up. And uh, that's, that's how it's going. So not much more to see. It's Sunday, March 3rd, 2024. And uh, we're just kind of in the first third of a Colorado low here. Um, we haven't got really any snow out of it, but we got some freezing rain this morning. So I'm glad I'm not out the highway trying to drive. Uh, what we're getting right now is some just some heavy wind. It's not especially cold. I think it's only about minus four uh, right now, but it's a really good day to play indoor games. And as mentioned, these Colorado lows last for about three days. So I'm looking at, you know, Tuesday before we kind of work our way out of this. I hope we don't get a huge pile of snow here. Um, but then again, it would be good if we did because we do need the moisture. So I'm okay either way. It just makes it hard to get around. It's a good time to get snow because it doesn't last very long. It'll melt soon. So yesterday I made some progress here, as you saw got the, the uh, lumber in and uh, that was very exciting. Uh, got a lot of it uh, cut up. I, I probably cut up almost half of it already. And we just kept the radial arm saw busy and cross cut a whole whack of it. I've got everything from uh, cross cut for six frame cover cleats to pallet runners and 10 frame cover cleats. Uh, so now what I need to do is take all of this and rip it through the table saw. Uh, so I'm just counting up the number of parts that I need on my sheet. I have to stay very organized so I don't waste material. Uh, stuff like this, here's a, here's a little thing. I heard Bob Benny say one time on his channel, uh, the saw guy can make or break your business. And I think it's, uh, there's some validity to that for sure. Uh, there's a, a couple of these, I've got some cracks. This one's not too bad, but there's a crack there. So I can make a cleat out of there, make this my waist and make another couple of cleats there. Uh, so that's just kind of the, the thing you look for. The cleats are not um, that critical as far as, as far as a beautiful piece of lumber. You know, I've got a kind of a nasty knot here. But I've got some waste, so I can start on this side and work across and make this my waist. Same here, a little bit of bark there. That's not going to hurt a cleat at all, uh, especially a top cleat. A top cleat really takes up space. It, it doesn't do a lot for, uh, it doesn't have to be um, structurally rigid. An end cleat, you're looking for some structural rigidity because it hangs down there by itself. So it kind of has to be in good condition. Can't have a big crack. You don't want a great big knot there. If you're going to have a knot or a crack or something, put it on a top cleat because it's 100% glue surface under that cleat and it'll glue it right to the plywood to hold it nice and stable. So that's really all I've got to say about this. And I'm just going to run this through the table saw a million times and it's it's dry uh, for the most part there was actually a few pieces here that had some ice on them so I'll have to watch for that when I go through the saw to make sure I don't trip my brake because we don't want that to happen do we we got the safety glasses well I can hear that wind outside it's just weighing on the building and the air protection and away we go That's 50. I need 216 of these overall. 
these are cut over length. They're cut to about 11 and a quarter long because you may recall at a cover, I'll do a final trim. It's tough to wrap these little ones on this side. may recall my table saw is also my assembly table so I need to cut all of my parts before I can assemble because once I start to assemble I can't cut any more parts so that's a six frame six frame cleat and that will in this case do either a top or an end cleat they're the same piece however the end cleats I run a rabbit in those all right, let's do some more. This thin kerf blade, I think, is really working for me. It cuts really nice because it's not very thick and it doesn't send as much material up the pipe. Okay, that's the six frame cleats. I didn't need nearly as many of those, but these I need a lot. And I don't think I have enough uh, blanks cut here for them all, but we're going to cut these up. <clears throat> and these are uh, the 10 frame cleats and I'm making 200 covers. So I need, I need 800 cleats. 400 of those are going to be two inches wide. 400 of those are going to be two and a quarter. This customer wants a little more overhang or hang down overhang. I guess overhang is the right word. Uh, at the end of the box. The overhang on my box is really only about three quarters of an inch. So he's going for an inch overall. So I think I can do the same thing and just uh, rip up 200 of these and then rip up 200 uh, or 400 top cleats and rip up 400 end cleats. So I'm just trying to think if I need to bother. Um, I'm going to go to two and a quarter to start with. Just make sure I've got lots of meat here for two, for three pieces. I'm sure I do, but I want to prove it to myself. And I haven't adjusted my gauge for my thin kerf, so I always want to measure it. These are not, <laughs> these cleats do not have to be bang on accurate but if they're within a sixteenth that's good so i'll cut a few of these Okay, this is half the end cleats. So I have to do that many more end cleats. And then I have to do that many more top cleats. So <laughs> that's, uh, that's a lot of times through the saw. So we're just gonna keep doing this. I'll cut cleats for a couple of days probably. And 
you know, I have to get more lumber from outside because obviously I'm going through this pretty fast. But what I can do is uh, with my, my cut list optimizer and my spreadsheet is once I do a big batch, then I can go and subtract these from my spreadsheet uh, because my spreadsheet says that I need, I need uh, 400 end cleats. And uh, then I can, you know, knock these off. I've, I've got uh, 200 here. And so I can go over there and, and knock off two. Say I've got 200. That'll calculate in what's needed, another 200. I can type that into my cut list optimizer and, and refresh all of the pieces that I still need. Run it again. And that'll give me again some some uh, efficient uh, efficient cross cuts because the lumber's too big to bring in here and and rip it. Uh, you know, I think in a in a different world it would be nice if I could take that 16 foot lumber and just run it right through the table saw at two and a two and a quarter or two inches whatever I need, and then start cross cutting. But that's not feasible because you've seen me cut eight foot material here and it goes all the way to the table saw. Um, so I certainly can't do 16s. My building's only 30 feet long, so there's no way I could get 16 feet of in feed and 16 feet of out feed. So anyway, that's why we, uh, we bring it in, cross cut it first into these size pieces and then rip it. This is very, very efficient because there's, you can see the off cut, the off cut's very small. I don't think I can use that off cut for anything. It's only about a quarter of an inch. Um, I try to keep them for a period of time to see if I need them and then I'll get rid of them if I don't. Uh, so that's, that's the deal. So I think uh, I'm gonna keep going here. I'm gonna go through all of these. Uh, then I'm gonna cut my runners. I'll count up the pieces I have and then transpose those uh, figures from the spreadsheet that uh, t tells me what I need yet. I'll put those numbers into cut list optimizer and run that again and it'll tell me then how to cut the next few lengths of, uh, of uh, one by eights. And as I go, as I get down to the end, it becomes a little more complicated because you know, you can imagine when I need, when I need 800, um, uh, these are 11 and, or these are 16, seven eights. If I need 800 of those, then it just says, you know, grab 15 lengths of two by six and cut it at, uh, at 16 and seven eights. Uh, but if I only need five or 10 or 20 or something, then it, it has to piece those out among other parts, but it's very good at that too. So I'm just going to continue on at this and thanks for watching. It's Monday, March 4th, 2024, and I'm inspired. I'm inspired. I couldn't wait to get back to work today. Uh, so you can see that I've cut a lot of lumber up yesterday, and uh, I've got my parts here. I've got associated offcuts here, so I'm doing pretty good. There's not that much here. I, something went wrong here with uh, one of my parts. I ended up ripping a, or cost-cutting a lot more lumber than I needed, however, if you see back here, this is a mini mating nuke. I'd like to make some of those so these offcuts can be just trimmed a little bit and turned into those minis. Uh, so give you a better look here at what's going on here. So this is this is the part stash till now. I uh, have all of my runners cut in the back here and then I'm just a few short on a few other of my parts. Um, so these stack up really nice on the pallets and they'll be kind of put aside until they're needed for assembly. The storm has mostly passed for now. Uh, the forecast said we're maybe gonna get a little more snow this evening, but it's really, really windy out there. It's minus 13 C, but the wind chill is minus 22. <laughs> it's really windy, it's cold, uh, and I have to go outside and get a little bit more lumber. So I'm not looking forward to that part. I'm very thankful on a day like today that my commute is 15 feet. Uh, so, you know, I'm kind of soft because I don't really like the cold weather at all. Not much more to report than that. Um, just going to bring in some more lumber. I'm doing uh, uh, new calculations on my cut list optimizer. 
Um, I usually do that as I go because stuff happens, like you do things like this or whatever. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll, I'll update the quantities on my spreadsheet, get a calculation for how many pieces I need of each part, and then transfer those numbers into Cutlist Optimizer, um, and then uh, do a new calculation just to stay organized and try to avoid miscutting lumber because that can get it really expensive. These 16 foot uh, one by eights, um, they're actually a little bit less money than last year, but they're $18 a piece. So every time I bring one of those in here, and I'm normally bringing them two at a time, as you can see. So, you know, I bring two of those in and chop it up on the radial arm saw. Well, there's $36 down the toilet. <laughs> if I do it wrong, it's down the toilet. If I do it right, then I can turn that into you know, 50 bucks or something, whatever they work out to. I keep talking about this thing. So I'm gonna show you what I'm doing with the spreadsheet and the cut list optimizer, uh, just to give you an idea of kind of what I'm doing. And I, I recommend this cut list optimizer. Uh, it's, it's web driven, it just runs in your browser. And it's for complex lists, it can get a little bit pokey, but it's not too bad. And for smaller, smaller cuts. One of the things you can do, and I, I haven't, haven't done this, actually I did it once. I had a selection of, of pieces of plywood and I had a certain thing I wanted to do with that plywood and I wanted to maximize to use these, you know, off cuts and random pieces. So I just quickly brought them up here. I measured them out, listed them on a piece of paper. I typed those in to the cut list optimizer as materials. And then I listed my parts and how many of my parts I wanted. I hit go and it told me how to most optimally cut each of those irregularly sized pieces to maximize the usage of the lumber. So that's something you can do if you have, uh, you know, we've all got wood sitting around the shop. There's pieces of plywood I've got. They're less than full sheets and, and odd sizes and off cuts and things. So you can have Cutlist Optimizer help you to decide how to best use that lumber for your projects. So let me show you that now. I've been referring to this spreadsheet and uh, Cutlist Optimizer, so I'll fill you in on what's going on. So the spreadsheet, first of all, I have listed out all of the parts for each of uh, four, say four products that I'm building here, six frame covers, 10 frame covers three-way pallets and two-way pallets. And here I have listed uh, my three customers who I'm not sharing with you <laughs> and how many of those customers want. So this customer wants 100, 100 pallets, uh, this customer wants 10 three-ways, this customer wants eight three-ways and so on. Okay, so now from this number I can use a formula to calculate bet uh, between this number, there's one plywood base required, but there's three risers. So, so I just use that number, come up with a total part count, and then as I work, I fill in this number. So I've already cut 100 uh, plywood bases for the two-way pallets. I have not cut any risers, so this is zero. And I've actually set up uh, well, this is another calculated uh, figure. It's simply a subtraction from how many I need, how many I have, and how many I need to yet to cut. And I've actually set up uh, conditional formatting to color these. If it's yellow, I don't have enough. If it's green, I have enough. If it's bright green, I have more than I need, which is always good. Okay, so you can see I have a number of parts. I have 200 runners now, so I don't need more of those. Uh, so what I can do is I can take these numbers here and I can transfer them over into Cutlist Optimizer. And again, I've got my parts entered in here, dimensions for the parts, descriptions, etc. And then so I can change these quantities for what I need yet to cut. And I can also um, activate and deactivate each part. Okay, so I've got the pallet bases made. 
So I've deactivated that. I don't need to calculate that anymore. I'm not cutting risers yet, so I've got that deactivated. Uh, I've got enough ru runners, so I've got that deactivated and so on. So then once I, once I uh, calculate this, just down here is where you set up your materials. Got my one by tens, one by eights, two by fours, three eighths plywood, three quarter plywood. And again, you can deactivate certain materials. I'm cutting one by eights right now, so it's the only one I have activated. This little arrow on the material and on the, uh, the part, you can click on that and change. This is this is a don't care situation. This is tells the application to cut that part uh, against the grain so that the grain is running on the short width of the part and this tells the application to cut that part with the grain generally I want my parts cut with the grain now <clears throat> this becomes a little difficult in 1x8 because there's not much space here and it's difficult to read um, you get this you get this result so this means I need to take nine of my one by eights and I need to cut them just like this. Well, it's kind of hard to tell. That's the biggest downside here. Uh, you know, that's 16 and 7 eighths, so I know that that's a, that's a cleat, either a top cleat or an end cleat. And the same thing here. So, so it, it arranges the parts. See, it allows me to cut all runners and then and then uh, some end cleats or top cleats actually I can see that says in this in this from this one uh, one by eight so you just go on like that see there was 20 pieces here that I could cut uh, almost entirely well entirely into runners and uh, with a, an off cut at the end for top cleat so uh, I'm going to enter these numbers and then I'm going to hit the calculate button. Uh, you can save your work. Even in the free version you can save your work. Over here you can save uh, your project. So I can load project and that's a number of my projects that I've been doing. Okay. So I'm going to enter these numbers and do another calculation and then um, and I don't have to use every every part like what I want to do now what I want to do next Is I want to cut these rear shims which are the same length as the runners um, So I want to cut rear shims <clears throat> I'm gonna forgo the side shims for now um, I've got some center shims uh, there's top and end cleats. Top and end cleats for six frames. Uh, three-way rear shims, three-way center shims. So the rear shims are inch and three-quarter and the center shims are two inch. Uh, so that's kind of a similar product. So I'll cut those. I'll do a calculation on those. I have to update the quantities before I do and then we'll get a new cut list and get some more lumber in here okay that was a chilly experience I had to have the door open and this ply this uh, lumber was sitting outside and it's all covered in snow so I'm gonna end up running the saw in bypass mode it's not what I really love to do but I can't run all this wet lumber through the saw stop uh, so here I've got some to finish off my rear shims for the uh, the two-way pallets and fortunately I can get four rear shims on one of these so that's great uh, these these are off cuts I'm gonna find something else to do with those as uh, for them and behind here you can't see but the off cuts that I created I've got a little stack here these are long enough to make center shims for the three-way pallets. So I'll cut those up for center shims 
I could have cut one more of these out of there, but then I'd have a short off cut. I can't make anything out of it. The center shim will use almost that whole piece. So it's just a little a bit of efficiency. So these four stacks here, this should finish off my requirement for top cleats and end cleats for the 10 frame covers. Okay, so um, I'm going to cut up these rear shims. The saw is already set for those. And uh, I've got a few here, so this is what I'm making, inch and three quarter by 33 and a half. As you can imagine, having a wet cast iron top is not ideal. Try to clean that up as quickly and as often as I can. I'm not the kind of uh, woodworker that tries to maintain the aesthetic of my equipment in top form. I know there are hobbyists who do, and, and I, I respect that. There are guys who want their cast iron top to be absolutely pristine all the time. And that's, uh, that's admirable. In this case, it's just not practical. There's too much going on. I spend my entire day polishing this top. So that completes the 50 rear shims that I need. I need 100, I've got 50 there now. And so this is the second batch of 50. And I need 100 and I've just made 50 or I've, I need a hundred and I've made a hundred. That's generally not advisable because you, you're always gonna wanna call something. But coupled, two things coupled together, this lumber is actually pretty nice. Uh, and the fact that for a, a rear shim, it's one of those pieces like a top cleat that it's got a hundred percent glue surface on the plywood and it, it doesn't add a lot of structural um, properties to the piece. It's there to take up space. So I'm confident that by making a hundred of these, I'll have enough. I don't anticipate needing to cull any pieces while I assemble. <clears throat> But I might yet be wrong about that. I've been known to be wrong before. And I build these every year, so there's no great harm in making extras because then I've got them for next year. I can't label that, it's all covered in ice. I 
need 105 end cleats. And those are two and a quarter inches wide. And again, that two quarter, two and a quarter, you know, if you don't get that quite right, which I almost didn't because this is a thin blade, uh, that's okay. Because there's, there's nothing saying that that's needing to be absolute bang on 100%. Two and a quarter, but you know I'm going to measure it anyway, right? Just because of who I am. All right. So still going to run with the bypass on. Okay, now you can see there are eight bundles here of end cleats. Now, those need to be milled again, but uh, I'm going to just let them sit for now. We'll get everything cut up, and then I'll drag those out. I have to mill a rabbit in those. These are uh, top cleats, so they're two inches, and... Uh, it's the same old deal, rinse and repeat, right? I've got 50 of them there, 30 of them here, and uh, I need 400 altogether. So let's do this some more. It's Tuesday, March 5th, 2024. Uh, I've been getting along really well in the shop here. Uh, in two days, I've produced this pile of toothpicks. <laughs> it's always a little uh, unnerving to take a pile of $2,000 worth of lumber and then cut it up in little chunks like this. You know, if you cut them too long or too wide, you can do it again, but boy, if it's a little too short, you're hooped. But I think I'm, I'm good that way. Uh, today's job, I have, I have two choices for today. Uh, this is all of the, the one inch lumber for the projects. And I have yet to cut the risers, the two by four risers. And uh, I could go out, get those, cut them up on the radial arm saw, and there's room for a pallet there. However, uh, tomorrow is gonna be warmer than today, so today, I'm going to take all of these uh, end cleats and I'm going to run them over the table saw to cut the rabbit. So you'll see the details on the rabbit in a minute. So you can see the extent of my challenge here. Uh, we have 200 uh, in this stack and 200 in this stack. So there's 400 uh, end cleats, 200 covers, 400 end cleats. And then I have 100 and I don't know, 115 or so uh, and cleats for the six frame covers to make here. Uh, so this is this is a, gonna take me a while. Uh, you know, not a high production shop. But before I get going, there's a more urgent matter of business here. You can see this bag is half full of sawdust. So I need to go and pull that down and empty it out. Uh, the, the separator is likely quite full too, so I'll clean that out. Um, yesterday, yesterday I noticed the bag starting to fill up, and, and usually when it starts to fill up, that means the separator's full. So I went over to change the separator out. Uh, it's not full. So what I'm thinking might be the case is I'm getting so much better airflow out of the system that that there's a lot more draft in that separator and it's pulling a lot of the sawdust out of the separator instead of leaving it in there. I mean, the separator's half full, so, you know, maybe if I'd cleaned it out, I could have avoided the bag. 
but I'll clean them both out this morning and then that should really alleviate that problem. So that's job number one. All right, this is the first time doing this since I set this up. I can see a problem here, but this, this is not permanent. However, it's close to permanent. Uh, it'd be really great to be able to access this from the other side. Maybe I'll have to build that in somehow. This is just a basic clamp system. Just a, a draw catch, I think it's called. Comes off easy, doesn't go back on quite so easily. It's caught there. This stupid King Canada thing, I need a... I need a ratchet strap to hold this thing down because these little screws that are supposed to hold it down, they bought them out in the hole before they bought them out on the canister and therefore they don't keep the filter tight. If you don't have a strap on, you start the blower and this whole canister goes up about a quarter of an inch to three eighths of an inch and uh, then all the dust just blows out the bottom. That's just King Canada, you know, it's just kind of, that sort of stuff gets by them way too often. See, I've got the same problem on the other side. You don't want to toss these bags, they're kind of expensive. So just empty it out. All right, just doing my job. Just doing my job and not moving the camera. So I just got the bag backed up in there. Separator back in place. Bob's your uncle, back in business. In order to run those rabbits on these end bars, I need to change over to my dado blade. This blade was definitely getting dull as I worked. It's a cheap blade, it's about a ten dollar blade. So I may have gotten everything out of that <laughs> that I'm gonna get. So for dados, you don't need a riving knife because it's not a through cut. And you can't use the riving knife because the dado blade is an eight-inch blade, and that's a riving knife for a ten-inch blade. So that's my brand new $155 cartridge. Dado blade requires a slightly different cartridge because of the, the difference in diameter and width of the blade. Some people call dado blade a dado stack. That's a stacked dado. It's all valid nomenclature. Make sure I put these away nicely so they're protected for a rabbit. All the rust because of that water. For a rabbit, I don't need to be concerned about how wide the dado blade is. If you're not familiar with a dado blade, you set up a series of blades. There's actually two blades 
and then between those two blades or optionally between because if you're just doing a, a narrow groove you don't need to add anything between but I will add just about everything I have because I have spacers here and I have chippers here so these are kind of blades but they just knock the middle of the cut out you just have to watch you get everything in the right direction so you're not cutting with the blades backwards I think I did that one time it didn't work very well at all so I'm trying to cut a uh, three quarter inch wide rabbit. So what I need is I need a little more than three quarters of an inch wide here. I think I've achieved that. We'll check that in a second. My little ruler. Yes, I've achieved uh, I've achieved 13 sixteenths, which is fine. I don't need it any wider. And they're really funny. There's this company, they produce, you know, kind of limited time, very high quality specialty woodworking tools. They're always advertising that. It's on an advertisement, come by for a, this is called a blade stiffener. It's just a big heavy washer, but it's kind of thick. And uh, they said, "Oh, if you can't get your your the nut on the on the arbor with your blade stiffener, we'll sell you a custom made blade stiffener for a whole pile of money." Well, it's a problem that doesn't exist because when you use dado blade, you don't use the blade stiffener. You just put the nut on because the dado blade the dado blades are really thick and they don't need any help. Plus, they're only eight inches. So that's one example of solving problems that don't exist. Get my dado throat plate in. It's a nice large cutout. Now, what I also have to do here, I want to unload my fence because I'm going to put on my sacrificial fence. You can see here how I've run the blade up against this in the past. I made this out of MDF and I cracky it fits this fence just perfectly. Nothing holds it down but friction and it's it's in there. Now what I need to do is, and the master switch is off so I'm bold enough to touch that, I need to measure three quarters of an inch. Get my bifocal here. Three quarters of an inch from that face to the blade. It's I can't really do it because the cutout is too big. It's not going to cause me a problem while cutting, but I can't measure it there. So we'll we'll run we'll run one and measure it and see how it goes. Turn that switch on. Okay, so these pieces uh, just need a three quarter inch rabbit, quarter of an inch deep, and I'll, I'll do it on this side because that's a little bit rough and I can get rid of that. And also set my feather board. Uh, see, in this case, I can set my feather board beside the blade because again, it's not a through cut. just to give it a little bit of tension to hold it tight against that fence. See how these feather boards work? 
I don't have it very tight so I can pull that back, but generally if I try to pull it back, it doesn't co come back because these fingers will grab it. All right, <clears throat> now that feather board is slightly shy of three quarters, so I can use my, my push block here. Keep down pressure on there. And I have two dimensions to work with. Okay, I'm gonna sneak up on a quarter of an inch high and three quarters of an inch wide. My mama always said, March weather's like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're gonna get. That's not quite true in Manitoba. You know in March you're gonna get unpredictable weather and usually some bad stuff. It's Thursday, March 7th, 2024. <clears throat> So we've had a couple of pretty good little snowstorms this week. Nothing super bad, but uh, cool, cooler weather, colder weather, and uh, 
probably more snow than we had gotten all winter <laughs> before that. <clears throat> uh, this this one that happened yesterday, it started snowing about two o'clock, and it's actually still snowing a little bit, but it was mostly done by uh, by you know sundown. <laughs> but the weekend before, we had a little snowstorm. Uh, that was a Colorado low, but it kind of went north of us, I think. And uh, we didn't get a lot of snow out of that, but a bit. High winds, a lot of high winds. And that's three days, Colorado low, that's three days. So last night, it was a short lived system. And you can see my pile of lumber starting to disappear behind the snow drift. I'm going to have to get the, the tractor and clear that snow bank. Because I need to get those 2x4s in. And they put the 1x8s on the 2x4s. <laughs> so I have to get the 1x8s off of there first. Before I can get the 2x4s even out of there. So anyway, today is going to be wood shop day. Uh, some brief snow clearing. Got to make sure the driveway is passable. In case we need to get out or emergency vehicles need to get in. And uh, then it's just going to be wood shop. So yesterday, on Wednesday, I spent uh, all day in a, an online course. Uh, I was put on by a Saskatchewan team on sustainability in, in queen, uh, I was going to say queen rearing, but it's, it wasn't, it was queen breeding, and there's a difference. Uh, queen breeding is uh, far more involved in, in selection and genetics and, and all that kind of thing. So it was very interesting. Uh, probably three quarters of it was above my head. Um, but, you know, it's always good to immerse yourself, I think. So that's what I spent yesterday doing. I got nothing done in the wood shop. And it was unfortunate, too, because it was a really kind of a beautiful day before this snowstorm started. I could have come out here and worked in a fairly warm day without a storm uh, and got my two-by-fours out of the pile. But I didn't. I was in the house. Uh, in this course yeah you just have to make those choices so now i gotta put my big boy pants on and get out here and and get this lumber now i'm freezing my butt off here it's it's a west wind it's pretty cold i don't know what the temperature is but it's cold uh so we're gonna go in the wood shop and we're gonna play indoor games for the most part i gotta clear some snow and grab those two by fours but then it's indoors That's the joy of a snowblower. So you get covered in snow. Oh well. Well now the driveway's passable and uh, I've still got some shoveling to do with the walk. Boy, the stairs are blown right in. However, um, I've got my little tractor out the door here uh, with those two by fours now. And so I'm just gonna use my trusty radial arm saw to cut them up. Now I have cut up uh, it looks like more than half of them already. So uh, I worked ahead on Tuesday and got a little bit of that done. So once these two by fours are cut, once the, these are risers for the pallets, uh, just show you here, this is one of them. So they're just 21 
and 5 8 or 21 and 3 quarter depending on which pallet I'm building. Uh, the big order, the customer wanted a little bit longer lid so it didn't fit quite as tightly and uh, so therefore I make the pallet to match the lid and so I'm careful to do that. So his risers are a little bit longer. They're sitting here on pallets and the risers that are on the workbench. That's for my pallets that I'm building. I'm building a th few three ways. Um, I don't need any more two ways. I mean, you know, you can always use two ways, but it's a matter of uh, efficiency. If you have too many, then you get inefficient and you waste them. So I've gotten by so far. Sometimes I've used up every one of them. And the thing is, I need pretty much one two-way pallet for every colony I run, almost. And here's the reasoning there. Obviously, I need one two-way pallet for every two colonies I run. So, okay, if I have 100 colonies, then I need 50 pallets. But because I use those same pallets at harvest time, then I need an extra pallet for every pallet of of uh, brew chambers I have and I can normally put eight deep supers on a two-way pallet a four high and still lift that with my tractor just barely I'm not able to at least very easily I have done it uh, lift that high enough to get it on my trailer I have done it but it's tricky uh, so you know typically um, uh, one of my colonies will will make between two and four boxes of honey so if that average is out to three then I need a, another pallet for you know every uh, every two colonies I need another pallet so that's the way it works out and uh, I don't know about numbers I don't I haven't really counted lately but I, I've gotten by lately um, I, I remember recently a, a, a good year I had a lot of colonies so they used up my two ways and I had a good honey flow so what I did was I took some conventional pallets some of my short ones that I use and I just uh, laid a, a sheet of uh, poly plastic on that uh, on that uh, pallet and then put the honey supers right on that the concern is uh, robbing when when I'm pulling honey I need to put it on a flat surface so they don't rub and also um, you know bugs and mice and stuff you don't want anything crawling up inside there once the honey is on the pallet so that actually worked pretty good <laughs> but the plastic it's hard to keep the plastic flat so there still were gaps between the pallet runners and whatnot through the pallet slats I should say uh, so it's not ideal. It's not what I like to do. But uh, sometimes when you need to harvest honey and you don't have any pallets, you need to make do. So I'm going to get moving on this. Get these uh, two by fours in from outside. I've got my radial arm saw still pulled out here so that the fence extends past, you know, all the stuff that's sitting here. And uh, I never really showed you this. I built just kind of a makeshift support. It's a kind of a, a side feed, in feed, whatever you want to call it, support for the radial arm saw. And it particularly comes in handy when I'm handling 16 foot lumber as those, those one by eights I've been handling, because that's, that's the height of the saw right there. And so I can pull material up on this. Uh, and, and the two by fours, same thing. I can pull them up on there. The two by fours are only eight feet, so they, they don't extend uh, to the support while I'm cutting them but that's a, a dandy little thing and uh, you know super cheap and easy you just screwed it to that table now this table is going to go away too so I might have to do something different this table you may notice it looks kind of bare here this was my 14 inch um, drill press and uh, I sold that so so that's good I freed that space up and now I'm going to plan to clear out this area and move my big, um, what is that, a 20 inch? My big 20 inch floor model uh, drill press. And I can see an interference here already because uh, it's just behind me and, and it's about this high. So it's going to run into this lumber rack. 
I'll have to reconfigure this yet again. Uh, but, you know, you got to make things fit. Hopefully, maybe next year when I start up in the wood shop in November, I can actually get some dust collection over here. Um, once I get the dust collector kind of settled down with the cyclone, I still don't have all the parts for that. Then I can get, I actually have a drop here. Uh, I've got some overhead pipes. I have a drop started there that can come down to the radio arm saw. And I might build just Y off of that and come over here to the, to the uh, drill press. Um, the drill press, it's not as uh, necessary as the radial arm saw. Radial arm saw makes a lot of sawdust. So when I'm done, I'm going to have to pull this radial arm saw out of there and then clean up all the sawdust that's behind it because there's considerable amount. Uh, what comes off of the drill press is generally uh, big flakes, like big wood chips kind of thing because I use a large Forstner bit or some people call it a sawtooth bit. Uh, so actually I collect that and use it for smoker fuel in the summer because it's a really nice, uh, it's it's fluffy kind of thing. It's not dense, so it makes really good smoker fuel. Sawdust doesn't make smoker fuel at all. Don't even bother trying that. So enough talk and now I have to get going. I'm making um, these two by fours I bought. I found that the, uh, the cheapest two by fours that I could get at my lumber yard are called studs and studs aren't quite eight feet long they're 90 and uh, 93 inches something like that and and that's okay because that's my off cut uh i don't even know how long that is five and a half um that's not big enough for anything i build uh so these will actually because there's so many of them and they're quite uniform i have someone who i know manages a daycare and i send them a lot of off cuts for the kids to use as building blocks and they love that stuff they totally love getting the building blocks so there's a lot i'm, I'm stacking them up here now because my my off cut bin is full i need to find something to do with those and that's one of my challenges is off cuts off cuts build up and they're they're a pain i like to keep them around because i maybe can use them I'm getting pretty good at knowing what I can use and what I can't, but sometimes, oh yeah, I can use this off cut, but I still don't have motivation to actually, you know, mill it up and, and use it for something. Cause maybe that product, I'm not actually building that product, um, at that time, like, like these minis, for example, I'd like to build some of these minis this year. Uh, but that's not a priority. That's just for me, and you know what happens, right? The cobbler's kids have no shoes. That's uh, that's my situation. So I've got some offcuts here, and and that offcut is big enough for a for a mini side, and so that's great. I can really make good use of those. There's not nearly enough, but I'll use them up in that in that project. But I'm not uh, I'm not to that point. So I need to just keep going on these risers and, and get the job done. So I'll open this door up. It's minus 11 outside. Uh, the wind is, I don't know, I think the wind is east or something like that. I was blowing snow and every, every 20 feet the wind changed direction and that's why I got covered. So anyway, it's not that cold. I've been walking around in t-shirt out there for short periods, but uh, don't want to leave it open too long.
you can see now how congested my shop's getting all the pieces I've cut up and here's all the runners well this isn't all the runners this is 300 of the runners now well, they're 300 of the risers sorry get my terms mixed up quite a bit but the other risers are here for the uh, 18 pallets that I'm building for for myself and uh, another small order for customer I have one more milling operation here before assembly time and that is to take my what I call my center shims for my two-way pallets and my three-way pallets and I mill a in this case called a rabbit rabbits and dados are similar but uh, a rabbit has two sides a dado has three sides so on this one this is for a two-way pallet I'm milling a 3 16th deep 2 inch wide rabbit and what that will accommodate is the the pallet clip here it's called a u-clip you can also buy a w clip this u-clip holds the 7 8 boxes tight together the w clip holds the boxes apart I, I don't know that you can get w clips for a 7 8 box uh, generally I think three quarter so they're wider and there's uh, it kind of comes up here in the center to hold the boxes apart and a lot of people like that because it allows it to dry you don't get as much debris in the middle and there's much box rot ants love to live in there too and the boxes are tight together I haven't had so much of that problem but I, I have had a little bit of issue there but anyway so mine sit tight together and this customer wants the same thing so that's what I have to do so I have 200 well I have a hundred um, I have a hundred of these for the two-way pallets I'm making a hundred two-way pallets this is one of these on each and then I have to do the uh, center shims for three-way pallets those are a little different because whereas on the two-way pallet I run a eight inch what I call a front shim across the front here uh, just to separate the two entrances a bit I don't do that on the three-way what I do is I simply extend this another two and two and a bit inches uh, ahead so on the three-way pallet this becomes uh, a dado because it'll have a, sh a shoulder here and a shoulder here uh, so it'll be you know captive in there that really just negates the need to have to have another part there and it's I think it's a really nicer design <clears throat> I just decided to start doing that so anyway uh, I've got 30 36 of those three ways to do got the saw set up here so that I can run uh, run these run these rabbits on the end and so the outside of the blade is set two inches from there so that'll give me a two inch shoulder here and then I can just cut out the rest of the waist there and you'll see me kind of go back and forth on it here <coughs> that's it's, it might look like it might be a little bit dangerous it's not really um, but you do really need to be careful all the time in everything you do it just really cleans that up really nice when you go sideways you run it through like this you'll you'll always get little uh, imperfections from the blade when you run it sideways it cleans it right up so you'll see here in a minute
Now that I'm done with the center shims on the two-way pallets, and I've also milled a rabbit actually on the one end of the center shims on the three-way pallets, these are longer. These are longer by by this much. It's just over two inches, I think. And what I'm going to do is I see I've marked that as to where I want to run the the dado across this one and so what I've done is I've moved the fence over <clears throat> so that I can still run that against the fence and establish this shoulder but then I've also set this stop block so that I can back it up and establish the other shoulder <clears throat> so I just kind of go back and forth like that so without further ado, let's cut some of these. Well, I'm officially done milling lumber. So how many days did that take me? Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. I didn't work Wednesday. Today's Thursday. And it's, I don't know if it's three, four o'clock. Four days to uh, mill up all the lumber. Now four days to mill up all the lumber, but there's all that plywood that I've already done. And that took me quite some time. That's a lot more work because of the big sheets and everything and kind of cutting everything twice it seems um, but i get to change the saw over again now and i'm going to start assembly by assembling the covers i think i'm done milling lumber i'm so happy <laughs> so thanks for watching take care and have fun It's Friday, March 8th, 2024. So I finished up yesterday milling all of my lumber and I've actually spent some time today organized some of it. I brought in a pallet over here. These are the, the lid shims that I cut. When did I cut those? Was it last fall? It was quite some time ago. And uh, I think it was December I cut those. So those were already ready to go, uh, which is nice. It gave me a head start. And so I brought those in. I'm gonna install, I'm gonna assemble my covers first. Of course, I don't have the plywood for the covers in yet. I need to bring that in. But I've got my cover pieces. I've got my cleats already here. My top cleats, my end cleats, I've organized it so that they're alternating top and end on the way up the pile and so I won't have to fuss when I need pieces. Uh, this this uh, pile is all pallet pieces uh, with the exception of, of just these. These are six frame covers, uh, cleats. So I'm trying to stay organized, <laughs> trying to stay organized. It's surprising how quickly 
things become confusing. Uh, sometimes in the past, I'll get assembling and get right down to it and, and realize I'm missing a bunch of parts. And so I tear down and I, I go and mill up a whole bunch more parts to make what I need, put all my covers together. And then a month or two later, I realize there's a bundle of parts stacked away in the shed or something. So that's not good. That's, you know, can be a waste of lumber. Now, again, there's always next year, but you got to make sure you don't do that every year because there's sometimes there's not going to be next year. When I go to my bee club meetings, we have a table that uh, people bring things. It doesn't have to be bee stuff either. It can be baking. It can be gadgets that have nothing to do with beekeeping, but generally it has bee related. And uh, so we put everything on this table and we have a bit of a door prize draw. And so in the past, I've built some of these uh, frame assembly jigs that I use and uh, they seem to be well received, uh, which is nice. So I'm going to take a, t a little bit of time out from the covers and pallets. I'm going to build a couple of these and uh, put them together, take them to the bee club meeting when I go. So that's what I'm doing today. And I'm going to make this, uh, this assembly jig video a separate one because this vlog video is getting real long now. And I will just uh, say thank you very much for sticking through it to the end of this video. It's probably one of the longest I've ever made and I won't use up any more of your time. So I really appreciate you watching. I hope you enjoyed it and uh, come back again next week. Same, same bat time, same bat channel, I guess is what they say. And watch for this frame jig uh, video to come out this week. So as always, take care, stay safe, and have fun.